ஐபோவன் வணக்கம் அஸ்லாமு அலைக்கும் அண்ட் கிரீட்டிங்ஸ் டு எவ்ரி ஒன் டிஸ்டிங்விஷ்ட் கெஸ்ட் ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் காம்ரேட்ஸ் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் லேடிஸ் அண்ட் ஜென்டில்மேன் ஐபோ டிஸ்டிங்விஷ்ட் கெஸ்ட் ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் காம்ரேட்ஸ் மை நேம் இஸ் லைனல் போபகே ஐ எம் அ கோ கன்வீனர் ஆஃப் த வாய்ஸ் ஃபார் டெமோக்ரஸி இன் ஸ்ரீலங்கா the international collective that is hosting this webinar i will be the facilitator today i wish to thank my colleague mr ranjit veerasinghe for his technical and administrative assistance let us start by acknowledging that this webinar is being conducted from the traditional lands of the first people of australia the wurundjeri people of the kulin nation the traditional custodians of this land we pay respect to their elders past present and emerging and the elders of other communities on behalf of the voice for democracy in sri lanka i warmly welcome the guest speakers and the participants and all those who have joined us today via the facebook and youtube this is a crucial time in the history of sri lanka for what occurs in the country today will not only impact the present but also the future of the land and its peoples in 2011 sri lanka forced to building the colombo port city on the land reclaimed from the indian ocean the then president mahindra rajapaksa and chinese president xi jinping formally launched a project in september 2014 nearly 7 years later in may 2021 the colombo port city economic commission has been made into law the port city is part of china's belt and road initiative it is seen by its spruikers to be modeled on singapore or dubai it will function as a financial hub in a special economic zone many parties including the opposition trade unions and civil society organizations are gravely concerned expressing the view that the port city will have adverse impact on the sovereignty of sri lanka in addition to the domestic implications there are also international concerns india appears to believe that sri lanka has ignored the indian security interests by allowing china to develop strategic assets such as the hambantota port and now the colombo port city india believes the port city could be developed as a naval port consequently strengthening the chinese presence in the indian ocean sri lanka however states that it will not allow any country to use its territory to endanger the security of india and the port city would bring 15 billion dollars in foreign investment creating over 200000 jobs initially and 18 83000 permanent jobs afterwards we cannot forget the grim experiences of the past conflicts which had direct links to the unresolved socio cultural and economic issues of the country and the ramifications of the open economy and free trade zones that were established since 1977 the international situation at the time was just as binary with lanka being pro us and india pro soviet the consequential tensions and geopolitical games have been very detrimental the question then that need to be posed is are we again moving towards a similar binary scenario with the emerging cold war between the us led western bloc and the pro china bloc the us considers china as its arch rival domestically the issues that led to previous conflicts continue to remain unresolved india and the west have grave concerns on the intent of the sri lankan regime and this could very well aggravate the volatile situation even further the speakers in their respective presentations will tease out some of the pertinent yeah. issues the first presentation will be about 10 minutes followed by two 20 minute presentations this will be followed by a 45 minute or so discussion based on the questions raised by the audience the attendees could post their comments and questions in brief using the chat line or the Q&A feature in Zoom preferably addressed to a specific panelist thank you now let me introduce the first panelist 
Mr. Gresham Epiris is a freelance consultant, a chartered mechanical engineer and a chartered management accountant. While serving as chair of the Sri Lanka State Engineering Corporation in 2004 and 2005, he led tsunami reconstruction and put the corporation out of the red. He was also the co-chair of the National Council for Economic Development, construction cluster of the Ministry of Finance and the convener of the National Think Tank on Construction Industry of the Ministry of Housing and Construction. He has served as director of the Industrial Technology Institute Honorary Secretary of the Institution of Engineers, Sri Lanka, and Chair of its Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee. In addition to being an academic at the University of Marutu and the Kotalawala Defense Academy, he has held top executive positions in the private sector and served overseas, including in Australia. Let us welcome Mr. Piris to his presentation, Port City, a Trojan Horse. Over to you, Mr. Fields. Thank you very much, Dr. Bobake and the other conveners for giving me this opportunity. Mayu Bhavan, Panakkam, Aslam Alaikum. Port City is a contentious issue and we have dreams. We had dreams, all shattered. Our children have dreams and would they become reality? The company that is handling the port city, Colombo Port City Private Limited says that they will make sure that these dreams will come true. Well, we wish well, and we expect those dream to, dreams to come true. My outline is, approach port city concept, and I will go through various aspects of the port city, suggesting a way forward at the end for us to pursue uh, vigorously. I will raise questions on different aspects and present these questions to the CHEC, government of Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lankan people and the world leaders and request them to the stakeholders to answer these and let's forge a way forward. Port City concept, how did it come to be? Uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa went to inspect the Southern Port uh, breakwater and saw some sand accumulation. And then he said, okay, there is sand, there is sea, and let's construct a city here, according to Wikipedia. And then the Port City company is saying, the breakwater was there to, 0.5 kilometers long, and the sea was there to take the sand. So technically it was feasible. It's not the way that we do projects. What happened to Hambadot? Hambadot was constructed, and then it has become the property of our Indian friends. Uh, sorry, the, the, the Chinese friends. Now, when I looked at Thambantata on the 19th of June, for the next 30 days, only four ships would be calling over at Thambantata. So that is not a proper utilization of the assets. When we formulate a project, it is up to us to make it successful. Because in that, we'll have to put the pieces together in a harmonious manner, like the pentagons and the hexagons on a football. So unless these are matched nicely, we will not get the right shape and we cannot put it to the expected use. Port City concept, we rushed with it, with the concept, didn't get that right, didn't go to the, go, go and get the uh, quotations, uh, proposals from enough parties. We got a single proposal and we went on, on with it. Now we have come to the stage where the, Project is being implemented and 11 requests for proposals for the land sale in, for the investors have gone out. On top of the $1.4 billion that the project city company has spent, it has advanced another US dollar 1 billion to keep the project going. 
definitely they will be using this to leverage more land. The government is to provide soft and hard infrastructure. So the government's responsibility is to provide soft infrastructure within the port city and hard infrastructure up to the perimeter. Does the government have money? When we look at the, the shipping ports, there are enormous changes occurring. Up to 2000, the largest carrier would, be, would have been 10,000 TUs, less than that. Now it is 25,000. It won't be surprising if this limit goes to 50,000 TEUs in the future. So in that we need deeper ports, deeper channels, and we need more stacking space for the containers. Let's look at the picture on the left of the screen. The Columbia port was like that. Now there is a landmass onto the south. So is this necessary? Would it hamper the operations of the port? Well, the marina on the southern end of the port city would be just near the presidential house, president's secretariat, prime minister's residence, and the Indian and Indian High Commission and the US Embassy. It's a very high president's security zone. Secretariat, prime minister's residence, and the Indian. Now, if you look at the discrete elements of the port city, it could have been dispersed to greater spillover effects. There is a residential element, there is a waterfront element, there is a financial hub, all these things. Only the mar marina should be at the waterfront. Other things could have been elsewhere. There are different places that we could have accommodated these developments, creating necessary linkages. If we want the waterfront, there is the Bayere, the Avanna, Kalniri. There are lands along the DR Vijayawadana Mount and elsewhere. Now, with all these things, what has happened? We have neglected all that. There is a huge opportunity cost. We didn't even develop the jetties within the Kalampu port. Now, we have to give away those things, those uh, jetties to various companies because we didn't develop the infrastructure. Colombo lands, we let it give out at cheaper prices because the infrastructure is not there. Education development, ICT advancement, for the last seven years, those could have been done with some of these monies. As Dr. Bopake mentioned, definitely the port city is in the development plan of the BRI. Now, we could have negotiated with other parties as well. Considering the resistance that is ongoing, would a Chinese company be able to attract the necessary international investment? Resistance, resistance to the BRI is growing. B3W is coming in with $40 trillion. And 5G telecom war with Huawei as the leader is on. Already India and the USA have raised concerns. Japan is not happy with the projects that were canceled. Sri Lankan government, does it have the capacity to structure a project like this, implement it successfully? Time and again, we have shown that we cannot do that. There is something wrong here. So with that, the Sri Lankan government has to look at this problem very seriously. And when it engages CHEC, companies like that, the caliber of those companies as planners, estimators, financiers, contractors, real estate managers, they do the planning, they do the estimation, they finance it, they write the check, and then they say, okay, this is our money and give us the land for that. Can we do that? Did Sri Lanka get a raw deal here? Yes, of course. Initial terms are not favorable to Sri Lanka. Did we factor in the South Port breakport two and a half kilometers? What was the value of sand that was used? As our, was it as our contribution? Or it was dredged sand that came free? Rock cat market prices from the quarries? Did we I mean, leverage on that? CHEC, of course, overpriced its, its contract and undervalued the reclaimed land and got a very good deal. So 
valuation of the common assets, like the, the that is the central park, the government is to provide the facilities. So the cost of those facilities, were they included in the cost of the land or the valuation of the saleable land? So playing into the hands of the CHGC, we don't have the money to develop the soft, structure, soft infrastructure and the hard infrastructure. Project is critically dependent on the CHGC. The government is just a silent bystander. Depressed global real estate market means that COVID-19 um, and associated trends, people are working from home and less office spaces are required. Major real estate destinations like Dubai, they are having problems. Flooding the Colombo properties market by selling other government lands will hamper the project and also those lands as well. Colombo uh, Colombo port city, is it a Trojan host? Yes, it is. Government has no funds, as I said, the lands of will continue to occur and ultimately the entire port city will become a city of China. And now the Chinese have collateral here developed lands for the other projects that they're doing. When the Sri Lankan government cannot pay other debts, the China, Chinese government would say, okay, that's all right. We'll convert that debt into more lands. So after converting the, the entire port city as a China-owned China, China uh, property, they can say, okay, I mean, now give us other lands elsewhere. It's a Trojan nose. Can we blame China for this? Yes. China has been a friend of Sri Lanka. Friends don't do the things like this. No, Trojans got the hose in and they cannot blame the Greeks for that. Like that, we cannot blame Chinese. World has changed, the economic jungle has changed and the, the, the tiger's spots also have changed. Sri Lankans remember that we are a proud nation once. Colombo plan, we had 27 countries co collaborating, cooperating. San Francisco conference, 1951, we steered the direction of that conference. And a landmark trade pact, rubber rice deal between Sri Lanka and China in 1952. That was again done by a Gautabe. Richard Gautabe, uh, Sena Nayaka, was the architect of that. Sri Lankans were at the forefront of the non-aligned movement. We had the summit in 1976. So when we look at Sri Lanka now, it is like the tailless bull that even cannot chase a fly. Way forward, I say that a full review of the Colombo port city development is needed immediately. And until that is done, freeze the sale of lands. Civil society alliance has to be formed, a broader one, to discuss about these things and do some advocacy and pressurize the government. Re Rescue Sri Lanka summit. Now, it will be uh, 70 years on the September 8th of 2021 from the San Francisco conference. We can have a summit asking the world to come around and help us to rescue our country. Request China to donate this land, the Fort City land, to Sri Lanka as the 70th anniversary gift of the rubber price pact. Sri Lanka People's Commission number one to review and report on the Colombo Port City project. So now these people's commissions, they are not convened by the, the initiated by the governments, they are. Uh, initiated by the people. One example is the People's Commission to decriminalize Maryland. Then make the Colombo Port City the meeting point of the BRI, B3W, India, Australia, and others. Like Rubber Price Pact in 1952, negotiate a comprehensive trade partnership, not only with BRI, B3W, and everybody else. Establish proper development framework for all projects. We cannot be doing this nonsense anymore. World Bank has the project life cycles. 17 SDGs are there to evaluate projects and the IFC performance standards are there to guide the implementation. A man who has never gone to school may steal from a freight car, 
but if he has the university education, he may steal a whole rail. Were there any educated thieves involved in these pro projects? I don't know. Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a completely different result. Well, Express Pearl sank near Colombo Harbor. Colombo Port City is near Colombo Harbor. Could the Colombo Port City economically sink, dragging Sri Lanka also down with it? By changing nothing, nothing changes. We might have to change a lot of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beeris, for your informative presentation on the many important issues surrounding this multidimensional puzzle called the Colombo Port City. The lack of a credible, holistic, strategic, and environmental feasibility study into this billion dollar project is so mind boggling. The socioeconomic consequences to the future generations of Sri Lanka appear to have been completely ignored in all this. Thank you once again for your insightful presentation. Let me introduce our second panelist, Professor Savitri Gunasekara. Professor Gunasekara holds a reputation for excellence in research and advocacy. She has published widely in the areas of human rights, rights of women and children, and development and governance. She is a board member of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and has served on the editorial board of the United Nations Secretary General Study on Violence Against Children. In recognition of her work associated with academic research and protecting the socially vulnerable, she was awarded the Fukuoka Prize in 2008. Professor Gunasekar served in the committee under the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Her contribution reflected the wide recognition she has been afforded as an eminent jurist. Professor Gunasekara was the first female professor of law and the first female vice chancellor in Sri Lanka. She is an outstanding educator who has contributed to reform higher education and also to the establishment of the Open University of Sri Lanka. We are pleased to have you here, Professor Gunasekara. We invite you to share your thoughts on the port city, governance, and the sovereignty of the people. Thank you. Your microphone is mute, Professor Gunasekara. You have to unmute your microphone and may have to start at the beginning. Yes, now. Thank you, you Dr. Pope and Voice of Democracy, for inviting me to be a panelist at this webinar on the economic zone of the port city of Colombo, established by the Act of Parliament on the 19th of May 2021. Discussions like this in public fora are important to help ensure that public institutions function democratically and in the public interest. As President Obama said in a recent interview, democratic governance is not self-executing. It does not happen automatically, but we have to work at it. And so citizen engagement with the functioning of public institutions is one way of working towards democratic governance, transparency, and effective management of public institutions. 600 acres of land reclaimed in one of the most scenic areas of the city of Colombo with a beautiful expanse of ocean has become the fourth city economic zone. This idea of special economic zones is not novel and there are many in Asia and Africa. And this particular economic zone is said to be conducted in the manner of a service economy supporting service, service oriented industries. The zone will have special rights and privileges to facilitate foreign direct investment operating as an international hub in areas such as international trade, shipping, banking, offshore banking and financial services, IT outsourcing, tourism, and entertainment. Those who have uh, argued for uh, this Port City project 
uh, refer to the fact that it is going to have a great impact on the people of Sri Lanka with a triple down effect and which will give the people milk and honey, kiri and penny. 2,000 jobs are anticipated in the next five years and employees will earn dollar sal salaries. The uh, chief partner in the operation Bowen will be China, recognized as a global uh, uh, power. And this is said to be within our uh, tradition of non-alignment in foreign relations. Now, the geopolitical implications are going to be discussed at this uh, seminar by Dr. Sarabhan Muttu. I want to focus on the domestic implications of the Sports City Initiative in our country in light of our own system of governance and regulation of public institutions, because I think that's in, important. Uh, China's in, engagement has been often demonized, but it is, must be recognized that China is a country which has delivered social and economic rights to people, especially in the area of health and education. And this is shared, a tradition shared by Sri Lanka, where without constitution and laws, we have never the less recognized health and education as the rights of the people. Yet there is a difference because China's governance and regulatory framework does not recognize civil rights. For example, the right to information, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of arrest embedded in the Sri Lankan form of governance. So is that, therefore there's a major difference. And at the same time, there's an evidence base to show that these economic zones and their success and failure depends on the regulatory framework and its institutions established to manage these zones. Now, looking at it from that perspective, it is important to recognize that this fourth city cannot function outside the core dimension of constitutional governance. Constitutional governance and a written constitution means that the different organs of government, their powers are limited and they are limited by the constitution survey and those must apply. So there is no sense of unlimited power. Besides, we have also bought into this concept of sustainable development. We have a sustainable development act in this country. And that means that economic growth must be balanced with uh, concern for environmental conservation and also for the human rights of the people and their right to human rights based development and good social indicators. And I don't think that approach can at all be qualified when we look and scrutinize the port city and how it will function. Central to this uh, concept of this different governance is also the sovereignty of the people. Now, there is a perception that after the 20th Amendment, the president has become a ruler, a kind of king who can, uh, at his discretion, rule and govern the country. This is not correct because under the constitution, elected presidents and parliamentarians are given, they don't come into power, they come into office and therefore they, they are, they are functions and responsibilities must be governed by a framework of law and constitution. The idea of sovereignty first interest was first introduced into this country in the 1972 constitution. It was fleshed out in 1978, and it is clearly stated in Article 3 and 4 of our constitution that the sovereignty of the people is manifested in the institutions of government, the parliament, the courts, uh, and the um, pres executive presidency, and also with respect and regard for the rights, fundamental rights, also indicated as a pillar of governance and the right to vote. So that framework has not been changed by the 20th Amendment. And indeed, the, this, the, the president is, uh, he's, he can be, he, he's liable for violation of fundamental rights. There are four articles, for example, on equality, and so in this controversial context where there has been a presidential pardon for the lawyers, one must also say that those people protesting on the roof of a prison can also claim 
that they have been denied the right to equality and protection under the law. So these are responsibilities that he cannot, he is subject to in whatever he does in relation to the fourth city. Now on Posen Day, the president said that uh, he believes in being guided by the Dasaraja Dharma. Now this might have quintessential wisdom, but we must remind that he is no monarch. In 2018, the Supreme Court of this country said that since 1972, uh, when we became a republic, a republic, this country has not has known no monarch, and the president has not inherited his mantle. So, in that light, we have a right to demand that any kind of discretion exercised by him in relation to the port city will be circumscribed by his obligations under the constitution and the laws of the land. Uh, it is this is why, for example, today. In light of this presidential pardon, which is controversial, the Bar Association of this country has stated that the president must have followed Article 34 and 1 of the Constitution, which sets the parameters within which he can exercise his discretion. And therefore, we have to recognize and also demand that the port city and its administration and governance must, must conform to those values. Now, on this constitutional framework, there are three pillars of governance, and there's parliament, the uh, courts, uh, the, uh, and the executive president. Uh, in relation to parliament, there are powers of financial regulation, for a financial monitoring, which have to also, uh, we, which have to be recognized. This was controversial in the debate, and it was pointed out that parliamentary oversight has been undermined, the several provisions were changed, but still the opposition said that these provisions on financial accountability and oversight are not enough, and that there could be money laundering, there could be various excesses, and therefore the ethos of this port city and the regulatory framework, which is based on the idea of ease of doing business, minimizing the burden of compliance can be problematic when it comes to uh, oversight, particularly because of the dangers of uh, money laundering and, uh, and uh, terrorist financing, uh, etc. There are also exemptions with regard to tax, the Foreign Exchange Act, the tax laws, and this then has serious uh, risks for financial governance. Also, we do have a problem in this country of a weak parliamentary system because of our system of proportional representation, the fact that the country does not have a choice in electing people of competence and integrity because a party of apparatus dominates. There's much public disenchantment. Very recently and quite shockingly, one of the older parliaments in part, parliamentarians in parliament actually said that the sinking of the uh, express purpose a good thing for the country because we would get compensation which would help solve our financial problems. And another who is a very senior parliamentarian, probably octogenarian, nonogenarian, uh, said that he was anguished by the provisions on erosions of worker rights in the Port City Bill and he actually had a memorandum in that regard but he withdrew it because of the advice of his seniors. So in that context, I think parliamentary oversight on the port city may become a serious problem unless there are some reforms and changes, a very sharp civil society over, uh, uh, scrutiny, a uh, very strong opposition, and in that way, and media to scrutinize the financial operations of the port city. Uh, the port city commission itself, which is the administrative arm, is an extremely strong body. Uh, it has all powers with regard to issuing licenses, registration, selling, transferring land. It's immensely powerful. And this commission is appointed exclusively by the president. The ex officio members that were requested by the opposition, that provision was not introduced. So they are all appointed by the president, no ex officio members on that. And they have all these powers. And in that sense, then, there is a problem of oversight with regard to how they function. If that oversight is not there, 
then of course it's going to be a very serious problem because in this country we have seen the breakdown of institutions and the breakdown of institutional governance for instance many boards of corporations public authorities universities they do not function in the way that they uh, that they should function and then it then what happens is that these boards are ineffective as uh, as institutions of uh, of governance people on these boards share pleasantries and refreshments but sometimes just walk away totally disengaged from the process this creates an environment for authoritarian decision making by chairperson political interference so we have seen that in the bond issues case the silvedi case the problems on sri lanka uh, on sri lankan airlines and all these cases show that the governance in these boards and institutions is weak due to the fact that there is a certain kind of legitimacy legitimization of the inaction and the apathy of the members of the board so if then this court city commission uh, also functions like that it's a very serious problem because of their powers and the fact that this kind of scrutiny will not be there within unless the members themselves are uh, engaged in the process of management and uh, uh, and administration of the port city they could just become rubber stamps to a very strong chairperson which would be really which would be really a frightening uh, scenario so in that context again i would say that public scrutiny through civil society the media uh, and an opposition is extremely important if this body is going to function and give and be an effective administrative authority one special problem with the commission is the issue of land because they own the land as i said they can transfer and they can they can lease it and the special problem arises with regard to these beautiful buildings in the what is called the heritage square of the fort now we have an antiquities ordinance but that relates to properties before 1815 uh, and 1850 and i do not know whether these will come as within the concept of protected monuments within the antiquities ordinance so in that context it seems crucial to immediately ask for an amendment that will bring those things buildings into this concept of protected monuments so that then there will be a reliance on our brilliant conservation architects and engineers to do that job of maybe renovation modification etc within the norms of conservation as we have known in this country the problem with regard to the tisawaya right now brings into the public domain the serious issue of why not have our own engineers and conservation architects a brilliant cohort of professionals to engage in this process and why do we have to do this without that engagement uh one of the key pillars in the governance structures uh, of this country uh, and in the constitution are the courts they have a important oversight role because of the judicial judicial powers and this court commission act economic commission act has provisions which specifically exclude the application of certain laws for example the commission it is required to register a company under the companies act but the companies act provisions do not apply and similarly the indian revenue act and the foreign exchange act foreign exchange act deals with dimensions of money laundering they do not apply so in a sense there's an ethos of deregulation on this argument that business must be easy it must be facilitated compliance is a burden so it's a new kind of ethos and i don't know how the courts are going to handle this in the context of constitution obligations and that uh, then their and their uh, then their responsibilities of scrutiny of laws bills and also in the implementation of fundamental rights a serious problem specifically arises with regard to the employment termination of employment act this is excluded which means to say that those protections of workers in that act will not apply and you will have a higher and higher ethos 
Now that fire and fire, fire ethos may work within the city in, its, in, in the way that it operates. But these people are going to be also able to partner with businesses outside the port city. And when they do so, it is possible that they will bring a new culture with regard to worker rights, which can really uh, undermine the regulation labor laws in this country because of this interaction. And within, therefore, the port city, this concept of excluding laws uh, can be, uh, uh, can, can, as I said, create a ethos. There's also, also very, uh, another concept of investor protection, which specifically says that any transfers, leases, etc., done by the, or contracts uh, authorized by the commission cannot be, changes cannot be made, even if they are in conflict with the laws of the land. This is again uh, something very new, and I don't know what implications it will have. Now, counsel in the Port City case actually said that anybody in this, any, any foreigner can be a judge of the courts of our country. Now, this is very ironic because one of the strong positions that Sri Lanka has taken in regard to a hybrid court with foreign judges is that we, our system does not allow foreign judges. Actually, there is some jurisprudence in this regard in the Chitani Bandarnaik appointment case where Justice Mark Hernando clearly said, you have to be an attorney of law at law of the Supreme Court in order to be a judge. So it is not likely that you will have foreign judges operating in an environment where they can intervene in relation to the port city. But the fact of the matter is there will be this issue of how this deregulation uh, is going to work out uh, in, in relation to the port city. Now, in, it's interesting that in the area of fundamental rights, uh, it is very clear that the fundamental rights jurisdiction of the court will continue to apply. There could be actions for violation of fundamental rights. There could be writs to restrain abuse of power within the structure of governance in our country. And in that case, there is no clearly those those, those imperatives will prevail. However, interestingly, our constitution uh, limits the right of discrimination to non-discrimination to citizens. Also the right of freedom of speech to citizens. So how that's going to play out in relation to these foreigners who are going to be investors is another matter. In any case, the court city op will be, operation will be a challenge to the courts of Sri Lanka. And I hope that they will meet that challenge to stay committed to the basic values of the constitution, developing and following great jurisprudence that we have in this country, which recognizes the sovereignty of the people and the fundamental rights of the people in all these specific areas. And as the Justice Nalin Pereira said again in the dissolution of parliament case, sustained public confidence in the court system must be nourished by the courts, complete detachment in fact and in appearance from political forces and political settlements. So I hope that is the ethos that will continue and help in the port city administration, uh, help to make this kind of port city administration, which is not completely alien to the rest of the ethos of this country, but definitely within the framework of governance and the norms and standards that we have known. Now, in this context, one of the problems in the administration of justice recently surfaced all the time is the role of the attorney general. The attorney general is perceived as a law officer of the state and also the key prosecutor and central to uh, effective administration of justice. This has been a real problem. And the continuing problem is when he or she is a law officer of the state, then there is a contradiction with the other part, which is a head of the administration of justice. And perhaps, I hope in the future, there will be an understanding of this, of this and a de-linking of this. Otherwise, we will continue to have a situation which is really unacceptable, where the attorney general in public states that stated that the Port City Bill was constitutional 
And then the courts end up saying that 36 provisions violated the Constitution. In conclusion, if the port city is to function as an effective enterprise, its management must be connected and not delinked to the norms and regulatory institutions enshrined in our domestic constitution and laws. Evidence-based proves that regulation is important for the success of an institution and failures have been because of the lack of regulation and all its implication. It will also be a classic irony if in a country which has for decades refused to devolve power, share power with its own provinces, this becomes an enclave, which is state within the state. And I think Dr. Sarvan Muthu will address that issue. The uh, Port City Economic Commission's ethos of facilitating business and relieving businesses from the burden of compliance, that is also something which can contribute to uh, an erosion, a further erosion of the rule of law and the legitimization for ignoring the law. And I hope that that does not happen. That I think can be prevented if there is a strong media, strong civil society, scrutinizing the work of the commission and ensuring that it does not use this to act in a manner which is completely contrary to the law of the land. Today, we sometimes think of Sri Lanka as a fragile and dysfunctional democracy, yet we have sustained this form of governance for decades. We are concerned that the Port City Project will encourage foreign domination and a new and different type of governance because of capture by an outside and foreign force. Yet, if such a capture takes place, I believe they will also be due to the complicity or passivity of people and institutions who will hold office, as has happened many times in this country's colonial history. Individuals within the institutions of governance, within parliament, the public sector, or the judiciary, have a responsibility to make a difference and work to strengthen and ought not undermine democratic governance and the rule of law so that in the port city itself those norms and values will prevail. I recently heard a young parliamentary say right quite shockingly give us power we will do the job. Parliamentarians and politicians cannot claim power they can only assume office and must we must keep them to that norm and stand, standard of conduct. We must not legitimize the political currency of politicians coming to power rather than public office. We must monitor, challenge the happenings within the port city through citizen activism and engagement and organizations like yours can play that significant role. As Justice Mark Fernando said in the Supreme Court, unfettered discretion is solely inappropriate to a public authority which possesses power solely in order that it may be used for the public good. We must remind the president, the government, and the Port City Economic Commission that Arhat Mahinda on Poson Day centuries ago said that those holding state or state, uh, uh, those holding state office are only temporary guardians of the people's resources in a country. As late Justice A.R.B. Amanda Singh has so eloquently said in his judgment in the well-known Epavala case 2000, I quote, the organs of state are guardians to whom the people have committed the care and preservation of the resources of the people. This accords with the constitution and the enlightened concept of the duties of our rulers. We must and should ensure that the Port City Initiative becomes such, a, it does not become an, en an enclave of industrial or any other kind of economic growth where its governance, management, and administration are de delinked from those abiding values. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gunasekara, for your revealing presentation. You highlighted uh, 
the lack of legislative and public interest safeguards and uh, the need for parliamentary oversight and other safeguards. And um, you have already also spoken about the extent to which the ensuing conflicts of interest would be detrimental to Sri Lanka's interests. The need for closing the loopholes that would facilitate money laundering, corruption, and discrimination. The requirement to provide for the jurisdiction of Lankan courts, tribunals, and other entities, and the obligation to have a framework satisfying international and national standards in areas such as labor, environment, and many other accountability aspects. All these are open questions that will remain to be addressed for a long time to come. Thanks again for your presentation, Dr. Kunasekhar. Our next panelist, Dr. Pakiso Tisaronamuttu, is the founder and executive director of the Center for Policy Alternatives, CPA for short. It is an independent, non-partisan organization making a vital contribution to the public policy debate in Sri Lanka. The CPA raised several key governance and rule of law issues and filed a petition at the Supreme Court challenging the Port City Bill, pointing out the deficiencies and conflict of interest provisions of the Colombo Port City Framework. Dr. Saravanamuthi is also founder director of the Sri Lanka Chapter of Transparency International and a founding co-convener of the Center for Monitoring Election Violence and the Civil Society Alliance Platform for Freedom. He has served as a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Group and the board of the Lakshman Kadirgamar Institute for International and Strategic Studies. In 2010, he was awarded the inaugural Citizens Peace Award by the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka. In 2016, he was appointed Secretary of the Task Force on Consultations on Mechanisms for Reconciliation. He serves as a member of the Regional Advisory Group of Amnesty International for Asia. Without further ado, let me invite Dr. Saranamuttu to make his presentation, Port City, the State Within the State and the Geopolitical Context. Over to you. Thank you, Lionel, and thank you to the organizations for inviting me share my thoughts on this occasion. I notice on the chat that there is a concern that everyone who has been asked to speak on the panel are opposed to the idea of Port City and that there should be people on the panel who are for Port City. Let me say right at the outset that I'm not opposed to Port City. What I am opposed to is the manner in which that legislation was brought, the substance of that legislation, and what I fear are going to be the consequences of that legislation. What we must understand here is, is that for the first time, the Supreme Court of this country suggested that 26 out of 72 articles, something to that effect, 26 out of 72 articles, of that bill had to be amended in terms of a two-thirds majority and or referendum. Now, what does that say about the lawmaking process? Or does it say something very different about what are the real issues at hand? How come the drafters of that bill drafted it in such a way that 26 of those articles would have required a referendum and a two-thirds majority. Were they told to draft it in a particular way? Were they unaware of the constitutional implications of what they were drafting? And if that's the case, with all due respect, I think they should be sacked from the AG's department for not knowing the constitution of the country. But no, I submit to you that what I believe happened is, this is a major Chinese investment, a major Chinese strategic investment, and what went into it was something that was agreed between the Chinese and the regime in Sri Lanka. And they thought, they could get away with it. They almost did. 
They came with this legislation just before the New Year holidays. Why such a hurry? Why such a hurry to do this? A bill so drafted that it would violate the Constitution almost 25 times or whatever. A bill so badly drafted, or was it therefore drafted to serve a particular agenda? So my point here is, is that the manner in which it was done, even though the Supreme Court's objections are supposed to have been incorporated, we know that the proof of the pudding, as it were, is in the eating. And in the past, as people would come to Goldface to see the sea, they will now come to Goldface to see another country. Because the laws are going to be different. The rulers, if you like, and indeed they are rulers, are also going to be different. They might be Sri Lankans. But just tell me as to whether one can envisage a situation in which that commission appointed by the president will be able to say no to anything that the Chinese want. Can they say no, even if it is in violation of our constitution, our norms, our traditions, all of that? Can they say no? That's the real question. Arising out of that is also the question of as to whether we really have a policy with regard to this. You know, in 2019, we elected Gautambi Rajapaksa on the basis that he would provide decisive, strong leadership in comparison, in contrast, if you like, to what the general perception of the Yahapalna regime was. Can you point to a single policy, apart from the platitudinous utterings that were repeated last night as well, of the vistas of splendor and prosperity? Do we have a foreign policy? We do not. According to our foreign policy, we are supposed to, according to Jayanta Kolumbake, Admiral Jayanta Kolumbake, we are supposed to have a foreign policy that puts India's interest first. An India first foreign policy. Now, the other day, I think the president talked about the Chinese national interests. We're having Zoom conferences between the ruling party and the Communist Chinese Party. And we're being told that the ruling party should adopt the norms, the practices, etc., of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the point here is, if we are having an India first foreign policy, how is it that our biggest development project, let's call it that for the book, is totally beholden to China? with little or no wiggle to contest anything that the Chinese want to do with regard to it. This Rajapaksa regime has sold out this country to the Chinese. I cannot see a situation in which, given Port City and given what we place, the importance that we place on its development, etc., where Sri Lanka can turn around and tell the Chinese, no, we should do it this way and not your way. We know we have allowed Chinese submarines into our harbors. And it's only when the Indians knew about it and kept up a fuss that we said anything about it. So because of the profligacy of the Rajapaksa regime, 
the earlier regime. Now we are paying for it in terms of what is Sri Lanka's biggest development project, which is effectively a Chinese strategic asset. We have had a policy of non-alignment. We had a prime minister who was able to intervene in the sino sorry, in the Sino-Indian War, as indeed who did intervene in the Indo-Pakistani War in 1971. What we need to move towards in terms of the geostrategic dimension is away from this notion of perception of a string of pearls and choking of India to a rule-based foreign policy competition in the Indian Ocean, where the Indians and Chinese are here to stay. There's no question of any of them moving out of the Indian Ocean. There must be an understanding in terms of what they can and they cannot do. And that understanding must cover, must cover the governance of hubs or indeed economic zones like Port City as well. Because the moment you allow a different kind of government, in terms of essence, in terms of the way it will function, because it is the more dynamic sector of the country and the economy with tremendous resources behind it and outside assistance, it will color everything. What happens in Port City will have an impact on what happens in mainland Sri Lanka. And that impact will be a change agent in terms of the practices that we have been used to and in certain cases we have been proud of. But the idea of coming up with a rules-based competition I mean, back in the past, we came out with the Indian Ocean Zone of Peace. Do we have people involved in our foreign policy who have the imagination, who have the honesty, the imagination, the intellectual wherewithal, not just some sort of poster or slogan like Yat Mother or whatever, which to my understanding doesn't have an idea between its ears. Do we have anything beyond the neophytes who are running our foreign policy at the present moment who made this country a joke as far as Geneva was concerned, who mishandled the Millennium Corporation account, the Eastern Terminal, Do we have it or do we not? And that's the real question that we have to face. Or else, yes, we are going to have a state within a state. And indeed, even if those members of the commission who have been appointed by the president are all great upstanding upright members of our community, Governance in this country, in any part of this country, cannot be secured on the expectation of the goodwill and good intentions of individuals. We have a constitution. We have laws. True, the separation of powers in terms of parliament, the judiciary and the executive, has been obscured, indeed mangled, if you like, in some cases. But we have to fight to ensure that that heritage is maintained and that it's translated into the international political context, into a proper rules-based competition between the powers that be 
whose interests we recognize. We know that the Indians have an interest. We also know that the Chinese have an interest. The majority of their energy supplies pass through these waters. Indeed, at the end of the day, it is rather ironic that the Gotabe Rajpaks regime are also in the business of letting the robber barons come. And that the port city might well be not just the site of our future prosperity, but rather the site of a carnival of corruption. So, the law has been passed, it has come into effect. We have to continue to be vigilant. The organization that I had, the Center for Policy Alternatives, we've always believed that, and we were the first civil society organization to go to court over the port city. Well, we will continue to do so. But I call upon all the citizens of this country not to sit and make funny jokes about Port City or complain, but to get engaged in making Port City what it is supposed to be, and that is the motor, if you like, of prosperity for all Sri Lankans. One la last thought as far as this is concerned. You know, who is the Sri Lankan who has been through exclusively the Sri Lankan education system? High school to university. Who will get a job in the port city? And what kind of job? will that be? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saranamuttu, for your illuminating insights into such a contentious topic. Well, it gives rise to a series of more questions, I would say. Is China trying to prevent Indo-Pacific ambitions of the US and slash the Indian influence in the region? Will China exploit the Colombo port city for military use in the future on the pretext of maintaining stability in the Indian Ocean, just as it did in Djibouti, claiming it has an international obligation to achieve stability in Africa? Will Sri Lanka soon become a geopolitical battleground? We have to be very cautious of all these questions and as citizens of Sri Lanka, we need to be aware of what is going on. And this and enter into dialogue with all the participants. Thank you once again for highlighting these vexed issues eloquently. It is the discussion time now. Uh, already, Dr. Saranamutu addressed one of the issues that was raised, and uh, there are many questions that have been posed. And uh, I would like to uh, go through those questions and probably select, uh, categorize them. So there are legal questions that have been raised and there are trade issues and you know sort of all these uh, there are a mix so uh, let us go through all these questions and probably we could uh, uh, ask the panelists to respond uh, according to the context uh, of the question now let me go through the chat line and uh, Mr. Mangala Fernando has raised the question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can a future government overrule the current port city agreement? I think that relates to um, the legal situation of the country. Then uh, there is a question on QA line. Why was the land leased for 99 years and not 50 years? Will it be possible to pay off the loan earlier to China with the profits from the revenue? Uh, <clears throat> any other legal questions? Does the CPCA, that is posed by Santini 
Adagama. Does the CPC Economic Commission represent the government of Sri Lanka as it was established by the Act? I think we'll take those three questions first. And if one of the panelists could address those three questions, I would appreciate it. Mr. Gunasekhar, perhaps legal. Thank you. Uh, on the first question, yes, of course, to, uh, an act of parliament can be repealed by another government, but the former, when the, the Mahindra Rajapaksa re regime entered into this uh, initiative on the port city, the Yahapalanya government came into office pledging to change all this. But then when it actually came to it, they could not do so because the contractual implications were so serious. It involved so much financial commitments that they couldn't do it. So what they negotiated was to negotiate to change some of the provisions. So if though technically this can be done, it is not possible in terms of the contractual and other obligations that have been part of this whole initiative. Uh, and the second question, I what was that? The second question? Can you repeat the second question? I didn't hear it. Unmute From yourself, Lara. Uh, why was the land leased for 99 years and not yes. 50 years? Did now, the, the, the lease of 99 years, this is a kind of 99 year leases were done even in the time with the British. You have an asset and then you lease it and you lease it for a long time. That gives a certain kind of permanency to the transaction because if you can't sell outright and you give this enormously long lease, you are therefore creating an environment when that lease can't be broken, when it can, cannot be changed. So that connects with my previous response that actually technically they can repeal the law, maybe they can change the law, but whether they can, it's, it, it is not possible to get out of this project, of this lease of 99 years for the Port City Economic Zone. There was another question. Does the CPC Economic Commission represent the government of Sri Lanka as it was established by the Act? And there is a related question. Can any panelists please clarify that this Port City Agreement is a country-to-country -country arrangement? Isn't all this rather the Sri Lankan government's agreement with Chinese private sector organizations or even semi-government Chinese banks? Only time we ever received a grant from the government of China was almost half a century ago with the BMICH. I think those two may be related. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, the point about it is this, is, is that, you know, whether it is with a Chinese private company or whether it is with a formal state institution, the way that the Chinese operate is that a private company does not have the degree of autonomy that we're talking about, uh, where we expect a sort of clear division between a private sector and a public sector. The Chinese private companies, they all, at the end of the day, they work according to the agenda of the Chinese Communist Party and of the Chinese government. I have no, no doubts with regard to it. I mean, of course, it's not formally accepted or all of that, but that is the relationship. So, you know, working with a Chinese company is not very really different to working with the Chinese government at the end of the day. Uh, there are, say, this is more related to trade and free trade, zone, free trade zones. Uh, can a panelist contrast the free trade zones with the poor city? Then I uh, think this could be related. I understand that US dollars, so Chinese remember, will be legal tender for payment of salaries in the port city, like in some countries like Kampuchea or Zimbabwe. Will our Sri Lankan rupees, which the banknotes say are legal tender in all of Sri Lanka, be valid in the port city? Professor Gunasekhar, I'm not sure whether I quite know the answer to this. I'm not quite sure whether I really know the answer insofar as yes, people will be paid in US dollars and they will uh, therefore use US dollars in day-to-day -day business, et cetera. What we do know is, is that if you go from the mainland to Port City and you purchase anything, when you leave, 
you pay whatever duty and whatever it is to the port city before you come back to the mainland. So, I mean, I suppose, yes, local currency is valid, but <coughs> it will be demarcated in US dollars, I would imagine. Now, I think this question may go to <coughs> Mr. Christian B. Sorry. You cannot rely on, uh, I totally agree with uh, this is proposed by Champika. I totally agree with engineer uh, Gratian Epiris. You cannot rely on past friendships. Any development done in Sri Lanka should be under the governance of the central government, which also should be transparent in their transactions and also be accountable to the people of Sri Lanka. Is this happening in relation to the port city development? Can someone enlighten on this? I think uh, during the presentations, this question was answered. But I think if somebody could repeat, probably Professor Gunasekara may be the, <laughs> this person to respond. <clears throat> Or anybody else? Let me uh, uh, talk about this. I think, I mean, when we go for a project, uh, we have to have some idea as to what we want there as Sri Lankans, whatever the project. So good old days, we had the BII, Bureau of Infrastructure Investment, which had done so many pre-feasibilities and we knew what are our priorities. So based on that, we were soliciting proposals, not from one party, but many parties. So we had a format on which the other parties, the people who are interested would provide the proposals. Then in a transparent, open process, all these things are evaluated using criteria, objective criteria, and then the projects are awarded. Even if it is with funding, so when we violate that, then of course, we will go with one party under terms and conditions proposed by that party to the detriment of the country. So the transparency is very important. Knowing what we want for the country, we cannot get somebody else to tell us. We should know that ourselves. That is the way it should be. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to add anything? No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, all right, okay. Um, there is, uh, this question is not so clear to me. Uh, this is posed by Shantini Walgam. How will the provisions of Articles 3, 5, 6, B, 71 and 74 work and which will prevail if there is a contradiction? Uh, I don't know whether she refers to the Constitution or to the Port City Act, or it is not clear. She hasn't mentioned. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that is going to be important in terms of what is she referring to. Yeah. OK, let, let us move on until uh, if she could clear. Um, uh, if, if you could uh, make it uh, clearer, probably by writing on chat line or question and answers. Um, now, there is another issue raised by, okay, about, okay, Luther Udeo Kumaran from Sydney. Uh, very good presentation. You said in your address that initiatives like this are found in other parts of Asia and Africa. Would you be able to give some examples, thanks? And then, uh, yes, also for a second, what has been the Indian response so far? Who is this? Who is this directed to? Uh, Luther, uh, no, they haven't uh, because it has been addressed to all panelists. So I think probably. Uh, referring to in particular, no? you said in your address that initiatives like this are found in other parts of Asia and Africa. Would you like to give some examples? Uh, was a question with regard to other other zones, other economic zones? Was that the? Wants examples of other economic zones. 
Well, I, 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 I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm not an, uh, familiar with much more than what I have read in ad hoc pieces. And as I understand it, there was a, there was an article by Dr. Dana Chasuria on the details of different, different kinds of uh, uh, port city, uh, sorry, economic zones in uh, Africa and Asia. And uh, uh, I think there's some resource literature by the World Bank, but what he points out is that in all those cases, the lack of a proper effective regulatory system did make the difference. And so his conclusion, I think it came in the island and there must be a reference to that, Dr. Diana Jayasuriya. But having gone through those examples, his conclusion was that in all of those instances, the regulatory framework did make a difference. And then he concludes with the uh, thought that we do have such a regulatory system. We have the laws in place. And therefore, there's nothing to think that uh, to, uh, no, no risk involved or no perception that this is going to be a failure for lack of it. Now, this is what I have questioned in my presentation, because what I was going to say is there are some strong issues with regard to questions in that regard. And unless we put some things in place, this whole thing can go completely uh, haywire. Thank you, Professor Mr. Ekara. Um, there are some other questions if uh, I have to connect them. The bi uh, this is an anonymous person. The binary situation between Sri Lanka and India has made several adverse effects on Sri Lanka, as we have seen in the past decades. Still for today, they keep violating and breaching the limits. If they value our independence, why this behavior? Simply the fishermen disputes. Now conflicts between China and India has brought us to a point where we can't trust anyone. Any biased perception, pervy attitude might have impacted by their personal esoteric affairs with India. After the Supreme Court suggested Port City edits, and with all these, would have happened in future sayings, for what measure we can trust the unbiasedness of this discussion? Uh, should I take that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, the point is this, is at the end of the day, we in Sri Lanka should know what our interests and what our policy is. It is because we don't have a very clear understanding or if we do have a clear understanding, we do not seem to have the ability to demonstrate it in practice so that we are caught between the Indians on one side and the Chinese on the other. I mean, we do know that the economic dimension has led us to this relationship with China, which is thoroughly asymmetrical. Which is thoroughly asymmetrical. The Chinese are here to stay in Sri Lanka in a way that they would have not ever before. The Indians have their own problems granted and they probably have as much as of a lack of articulating the, their policy interests and a lack of uh, coherence as far as that is concerned. But we need to get the two sides around the table and indeed, the Australians, the Japanese, and we need to agree on, look, all you guys say you have interests in the Indian Ocean region. What are those interests? Who has greater interests than others? India, China, each of our countries in the Indian Ocean have their interests with regard to their sovereignty protection of their economic and maritime resources. Now, can we come to an agreement in which, yes, you can have competition. And quite frankly, I think, I don't foresee the whole question of conflict. I think it will be competition. But can we have an agreement with regard to competition, whereby each time some development takes place, 
the whole region is not put into a sort of chill, as it were. My God, what's going to happen next? Kind of thing. But there are institutional mechanisms to respond, to mediate, to resolve, if there are differences. And, you know, so what we need is a fairly sophisticated approach to this and a fairly sophisticated approach in, as far as our diplomacy is concerned to come up with a proposal and to get both the Chinese and Indians around that table. Thank you. Now, uh, Shantini Valgama's question has been clarified. How will the provisions of Articles 3, 5, 6, B, 71, and 74 of the CPCEC, that is Economic World City Economic Commission, work? And which will prevail if there is a contradiction? Uh, and then uh, I think this may be related. I have no idea. If a crime happens, this is posed by uh, Rohini Virasinghe. If a crime happens, does our judiciary have authority in the port city? Uh, and uh, there is another post by Chelak Mudukama uh, probably. Is there any provision to invest Sri Lankan investors in this port city? Yeah. Um. The first question, if, the, if there's a, a crime in that area, as I said earlier, constitutional provisions in any case prevail. Police and enforcement will be not excluded because it will be part of the, of the city of Colombo. <clears throat> and I don't think there will be a situation uh, where you can say that, you know, the, the whole process will be entirely different. I haven't seen the act itself because it's not uh, available on the internet <clears throat> and I haven't seen the act. But I know that some of the provisions that were struck out by the, by the Supreme Court <clears throat> related to this issue of having separate offenses, several separate criminal processes. So administration of criminal justice, I have not seen the act, but it would appear to be entirely within the national system. On the other issue of whether locals can invest, Yes, if they are maybe dual citizens and they bring foreign funds from outside Sri Lanka. In other words, nobody can use foreign exchange in the banks in Sri Lanka. But if you are a dual citizen uh, and if you want to bring in foreign funds, then you can be considered as somebody engaged in a direct <clears throat> investment in the port city. Besides that, there is this provision for a partnership through lease of property. That is, in other words, locals can lease property and partner in that way with the port city and conduct, it, conduct businesses with those in the port city, outside the port city. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work out, but there is provision for that. So that is the only way. They can't, there can be locals can't just directly invest in businesses in the port city. Thank you, Professor Monsekere. Uh, I think uh, we would have exhausted most of the problems. Probably we'll like to go through one by one. <laughs> Just, uh... Uh, Dr. Bopage, yeah. now on this matter, uh, following on what uh, Professor Gunasekara said, now say for instance under the BOI, uh, when they give permission to various organizations, there are certain limitations and restrictions imposed. And certain sectors in the economy are exclusively for Sri Lankans, say retail trade. And there are certain scenarios where a foreign um, entity can come in, but with the high level of capital. So with that sort of scenario, uh, an entity, uh, an investor coming into the port city, with the linkages outside the port city, can they undermine those restrictions that were initially envisaged in the BOI schemes? Are you posing a question to? Yeah, I'm, I'm posing a question based on that sort of, I mean, an, an entity, an investor coming into the port city, having the linkages outside, 
doing business between the port while being in the port city doing business elsewhere with linkages and partnerships so there were certain sectors that were restricted so that the sri lankans could basically uh, do that particular sector work in that sector can that sort of this sort of provision within the port city bill uh, undermine even that protection afforded to the other enterprises elsewhere okay well i would think that's a parallel system not governed by the port city act the port city act is for the port city and therefore that parallel system with the boi i don't know there is i don't know enough to be able to say how it will link with business operations in the port city but what is clear is sri lankans cannot be cannot invest cannot become business partners except in this narrow way they can invest as direct for in for indirect investment bringing their foreign funds out of the country into sri lanka they can form offshore companies or whatever but not using any funds within the country and then when it comes to businesses partnering also they can only do it in this way you can lease property that's your contribution then you partner and then you can partner for within the port city or carry the business outside as i understand it those are the two only ways in which this can happen thank you very much uh, now i think we have exhausted most of the questions unless there are new questions either there are commentaries but uh, you know some of them are political some of them are you know sort of that uh, it's already happened so we have to move forward and do something and that sort of comments uh, uh i would like to invite uh, the audience to post any questions you have if you have no new questions Ranjit, uh, do you have any other questions on YouTube or Facebook? No, 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 no new questions, man. That's okay. all been. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, there is a there is a comment. Thank you. Opinions of of the panelists are mainly pessimistic. We have to move forward and find the way out. This project cannot be suspended any further. There is a. Uh, question or a comment like that in the chat box yes is from one here yes i think i mean the point is is that yes we are pessimistic because we have pointed out what we understand to be the flaws the pitfalls etc in what is happening at the present moment so what i would say to the person who has posed the question is is that you must join us in being eternally vigilant to make sure that this project proceeds as it were with within the confines of the sri lankan constitution and the laws of the country that's what's important that civil society is vigilant with regard to these rights and responsibilities i think it's not a just a question of i think uh, uh, dr saravnuti has raised serious issues on you know fundamental issues and question why this project so did have ever taken off the ground but now we are stuck with it because we've got the act it's part of the law of the land and it's on board so i think in that context there are all these challenges but as in the rest of as with governance in this country when we say fragile democracy and many of us say that a lot of people are saying that it's because we have seen an undermining of institutions systems in the last so many years and if we don't take stock of that stock of that reality and respond it respond to it each in our different ways as a society organization so as people within parliament as people within the opposition as people in public service and understand that this is a crisis that could really lead to the complete destabilization and destruction of the country if we don't realize that and do something about it then i think it's not just specificism it's the realism 
of having to you function with this porosity so that it would not do what we don't want it to do that is to be an enclave which has a separate set of norms values functionality administration because that in itself can undermine the rest of the country and i believe for example in the specific case of those heritage buildings which now apparently i don't know the <coughs> details of it but there's some <coughs> company conflagration arrangement which will take over those buildings i don't know enough about it but that's supposed to be on the cards if that is so why is it not possible to push for as i said an amendment to the antiquities ordinance which will make each of those buildings a protected monument and why can we not have the best of conservation architects and the best of engineers in this country to do what is necessary to 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 uh, Uh, to keep those buildings in the way that they should to renovate we are necessary without handing this over to some abstract entity which we don't know anything about so that requires the engagement of say professionals of different groups who have a vested interest similarly the business community uh, you know which is operating outside the zone and of course the other scrutiny with regard to um you know the violation of fundamental rights violation of norms of governance violation of abuse of power sadly we are not doing this even in relation to institutions within uh, you know outside the port city when i think of my own uh, area of university governance it it is shocking sometimes to see the poor governance because the governing bodies are not doing what they should be doing so this is a challenge in the rest of the country and i think it's especially so in the port city if for example the evidence base is that you have to have regulation normative frameworks rule of law for it to function properly then this whole lazy fair attitude which says deregulate you know don't have this thought that the other and there is no public scrutiny through the media through civil society organizations through professionals then definitely it can become what the particular government or the parts that we want it to be thank you professor for the sake there have been several questions that have been come later um okay i will i think i will have to go through one by one rather than trying to collate them uh there is one post by raj i think it was responded earlier but i still i uh, post that question since everything has been finalized and there is no turning back after all amendments and majority votes have already been obtained from the parliament is there a turning back so that is the question uh, then uh, why would the country exclude its own citizenry from investing within their own land uh, i think those two questions can be taken together there is a comment is the port city created for the benefit of the chinese or sri lankans uh, is there any provision in that to elsewhere to resolve disputes contradictions that arise between the two systems of governance sri lanka and cpc so <laughs> well i mean as professor gunasekar pointed out i mean you sri lankans can invest as long as the funds are brought from outside yeah as long as the funds are brought to bargain they can invest i mean the second point was you know is this being done for the chinese benefit or for the sri lankans benefit well i think the as was a short answer is that it is being done for the chinese benefit by the sri lankans have been told that it is to their benefit so that it's a win win situation according to those who are supporting and proposing this particular uh, version of a port city bill at the end of the day i think you know if the port city doesn't take off in its developmental aspects as being that great magnet to draw the what 15 billion investment or whatever what we do have is an asset that the chinese have which can be used strategically and that is what we have to watch out for that we don't become we hold it to the chinese in any way if we can make this a project that is truly international 
okay, the Chinese are the biggest investor, but if they make it truly international, then I think it would have a different complexion. Thank you, Dr. Saranamurthy. There is a question by one Ralph. When you invite trading in derivatives or a stock in the financial center when it is operating, what are the impacts on the local verse? I think it is more technical. I don't understand. It's more to do with trade and uh, uh, I think uh, Mohan Kumaraswamy has posed a question following up on engineer Gration Pires' question. Would it not have been better to have a catch-all overriding clause? I think he may be referring to an omnibus clause that says in case of any contradiction with Sri Lankan law, the Sri Lanka law shall prevail over any port city provisions. It is clear as I said, that this port city will not be able to function outside our framework of governance in the constitution, etc. Those basic laws will apply. But there are specific laws which have been exempted, and these are of concern. For example, the Termination of Employment Act is a very important labor law, which gives security of the It's controversial, but whatever it is, it is there. It's one labor law, and that has been excluded. So in other words, that won't apply to the fourth city. Same in regard to financial matters is the Inland Revenue Act, uh, as well as the Foreign Exchange Act. So those have been excluded. There are several others, uh, you know. But basically, some of the others, like for instance, the municipality laws, uh, the law, the, the, the UDA law, there's nothing to say that it has been, it's not, not applicable. So those are things that have not been clarified. But for instance, in the, with regard to the heritage sites, clearly the antiquities ordinance will apply. And financially also, except for the fact that the, interestingly, the Companies Act provisions have been excluded. And I don't know how that's going to operate because you register as an offshore company and, under the Companies Act. But at the same time, the provisions of the Companies Act don't apply. So how that can be worked out, I don't know. People in business would probably know how or what that, that, that means. So some have been excluded. And if they have not been excluded, definitely there will be people who can within both cities. But this is the point. The problem is this all-powerful commission. The economic commission can give licenses, register, do what it's like, land transfers, etc. So in the process of doing that, what erosions will be? This is one of the risks and the dangers. So it's not being pessimistic. It's a real issue of functionality and management of this Port City Commission. How will it function in this regard? where will be the erosions. And that is where, in the absence of oversight, monitoring, uh, you know, uh, publicity with regard to what is happening, then there is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kunasekare. <clears throat> uh, Shantini Walgama has made an observation. Uh, what was agitated that the apex court was constitutionality of the bill and not the contents of the bill, which conferred unfettered, unfettered powers to the commission. This is my observation, so that's OK. Um, Dr. M.K. Raghunathan has posed a question. Is there any similar project in other countries where Chinese made the country was benefited enormously? So probably whether there are any international experiences. Anybody who knows about international experiences? I mean, we do know that there are other places in which the Chinese have invested, but I have to admit that I, I would insist on making any comment on it because I haven't done a lot of research or study with regard to it in terms of who is benefiting or not. So I rest my case as it were. I um, I will just make a comment with regard to the question posed. Say, uh, with regard to Australia and the Pacific Island nations, there is this ongoing dispute because Chinese have invested a lot 
in those specific islands. And uh, uh, most of the investments have been making no returns to the for the benefit of the people there. So, and then there is uh, uh, ongoing uh, issues between Australia because Australia is pro-West, pro-American, you know, they have linkages. And then expanding the Chinese influence on Pacific Islands is seen as a threat. So there is this ongoing dispute. So, you know, we have to understand the situation and uh, if uh, those projects have benefited the nations where investments have been made, then that is good. But there is no evidence to support it. Um, okay. Uh, let us go to Justin Rajendran. Initially, Sri Lanka knew that they do not have the finance to create the port city. And eventually it has to mortgage to the Chinese. Why did they go through with this? With this? No, well, it is. <laughs> uh, Roshan de Silva from London. The office state in South, official state in South Southeast Asia also has a long history of creating states within a state. The multiple high security zones and special economic zones were exemplary of many states within a state in which the principles of administrative law, fundamental rights were excluded from judicial oversight. However, the elephant in the room is the wider cultural context of this kind of legislation. Excuse me. The broad contours of the new governing elite's conception of the constitutional form of the Sri Lankan state is a type of constitutional order that will enshrine the ideological values of Sinhalese nationalism, the central purpose of which is to intertwine the cultural identity of the ethno-religious majority with the identity of the Sri Lankan state as a whole. The Han Chinese state with which the Chinese Communist Party have resurrected offers a constitutional model which will establish a monarchical form of presidentialism that centralizes uh, centralizes for I think his question is ah, okay. Uh, the logic of governance at present is the centralization of power, and this is now confirmed by the 20th Amendment. The modus operandi of the regime is to systematically weaken the constitutional safeguards of democracy, including the separation of powers, fundamental rights, and devolution. The consequence of this and the Port City project is exemplary of this is presidential authoritarianism reinforced by the militarization of civil administration. The port city legislation and the manner in which it intrudes into areas of jurisdiction with, within the provincial council list appears another way in which democratic pluralism will further shrink. Do you broadly agree and what next then to counter this? Very white. The question is over my scope. <laughs> We have another, I think this will be the last question because it is uh, in Melbourne, it is uh, almost uh, 10 minutes to 11 o'clock. And uh, so we will take this as the last question. Is there anyone who could respond? It is a more legal <laughs> devolution of powers and all sort of complications with that. Well, I mean, I, I would say one thing with regard to the whole Port City thing, and this has, of course, not been brought up, is, is that the Constitution, I mean, we, there is a requirement that the provincial councils be consulted. And this has not happened. And this is not happening because there are no elected provincial councils in place at the present moment. So, you know, with regard to the 13th Amendment and devolution, I think we will always have it, but it will be gutted of any powers. And at the present moment, it doesn't have many powers, but it will be gutted even of those powers. But it will always be there because trying to get rid of it would then bring the Indians down uh, on us big time. You know? But uh, 
we are making, well, we are making laws in the most ridiculous fashion. The way things are done are as important, surely, as what is done. And the way things are done in this country is, at the present moment, the lawmaking, the procedures, the process is appalling. It's absolutely appalling. I can't think of any other word for it. And this is what we have to guard against. This is that we have to come up with an agenda of reform and get a government that's strong enough to implement it, whereby the way laws are made are firmly institutionalized and respected by all and sundry. Thank you, Dr. Haramurthy. And uh, I have a question which I cannot skip. <laughs> skip. <laughs> I think it is not mine, it is forced by somebody else. Uh, this is with regard to the civil society organizations how to react. Uh, any suggestions how we can join civil society organizations to voice our concerns? Any specific entities? Many of the public who are concerned are not sure how to or whom to approach to do that. Any specific suggestions so we can contact them and pursue our concerns? And there is a related question which came at the very last minute. Give me a second, I'll have to go, go to it. In what way would you panelists propose that we citizens can gather in thinking as to what can be done to overcome the many negative trends that are indicated <coughs> by Port City? So well, as, far, as, as far as people wanting to do something and join up and all of that, please get in touch. Centre for Policy Alternatives is always welcome to anyone who is in agreement with our values with regard to reforming governance as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. So please get in touch with us and we can take it forward from there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Haramurthy. Now it is time to conclude this webinar. I take this opportunity to thank the three presenters, engineer Gresha Nepiris, Professor Savitri Gunasekara, and Dr. Paki Soti Saravanamuttu for their enlightening presentations. The issues will continue and all of us will have to cautiously monitor future developments associated with this multidimensional puzzle, the Colombo Port City. I would like to thank all the attendees without whom our webinars would not be successful. Your active participation by posting comments and posing questions help to keep the webinar lively and interesting. Let me also thank Mr. Ranjit Veerasinghe for his assistance. We of the Voice for Democracy wish to see you at our next webinar. I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on the location from where you have joined this webinar. Please take care as the world is devastatingly affected by the continuing spread of the current COVID pandemic. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.